My gut just jumped out of my stomach. And there was a large man laying on a bed. He was clutching himself in his belly area. After the location of the shotgun shell, Sergeant Trudy declared the house a crime scene. This is a case of fatal attraction. It's a case of obsession. If I met someone that was going into a case like this as a juror, I would just say, buckle your seatbelt. Austin, Texas, 1994. A lonely man in his 70s has recently lost his wife to cancer. His grown children have long since moved away, and he's retiring from his successful business. That's when he meets a vivacious young single mom who sparks his interest. Little do they both know that spark will lead to murder and betrayal. Steve Beard was kind of a jolly guy. He was a good businessman. He was a good family man in, in the old sense of the word, where he tried to take care of his family, take care of his kids. That was really the center of his life. Steve had his bad side. He was tough in business. He was demanding. But at the same time, he was loving. He was loyalty bound. If you were his friend, y'all were friends for life. And his friends, they love him. He was one of the founders of what's now the CBS TV station in Austin, Texas. When he met Celeste, he was just selling the station and he was pocketing millions of dollars. So he was very wealthy. She was a cocktail waitress at Austin Country Club. When they met, Celeste was still married to a man named Jimmy Martinez, but he didn't have the big bucks, the lavish lifestyle, the fancy million dollar home, the country club memberships. And Celeste always wanted to be rich. Celeste is really an interesting character. I don't know that I could have made her up. She came from a really tumultuous family. There was a lot of chaos in her life growing up. And she grew up to be this very charming, very witty, very fun-filled woman who had a very kind of uh, an emptiness inside of her. And she spent a lot of her life trying to fill that. Celeste married three times before she was 30 years old. I think she was the type of woman who saw opportunities with different men and thought about what they could do for her, for her lifestyle. When she met Steve, he was this grieving widow. He'd been married for 40-some years to Elise, and she had just passed away from cancer. It had been a long, grueling, grueling uh, parting. And he was hurting, he was alone, he was lonely. Steve fell in love with Celeste's kids. She had two girls, Christina and Jennifer, twin daughters that she had with the first husband. It gave him this opportunity to be a father again, to act like the young dad. He became kind of the soccer dad. And he just loved Christina and Jennifer. They had their first date in October. By December, they were looking for property to buy together, or should I say property for Steve to buy for her. He built her a beautiful house, and he filled it with everything she could have wanted. He bought her jewelry. She was wearing a 42-carat diamond ring. On October 2nd, 1999, Steve wakes up. He sees a flash of light, wakes up, sees his guts in his hand. He reaches over to the phone, calls 911. Uh, what is going on there? My gut just jumped out of my stomach. Out of here. They blew out. Yeah, they blew out of my stomach. They're, they're laying on my stomach. OK, they're, they're laying on your stomach? Yes. I'm in bed. OK, sir, how did I'm in awful pain. Sir, how old are you? 75. OK, are you there by yourself? Uh, my wife is somewhere in the house. I can't find her. We were dispatched to assist EMS on a medical call. I drove down the driveway of the house. The house was pretty much blacked out at the time. I exited my patrol vehicle and went up to the front door of the residence and began to knock and ring the doorbell. Meanwhile, on the other side of the house, 
Celeste and Christina were in Christina's bedroom. Not long after, Christina woke up and her mom said, there are police out there. And uh, Christina went and looked and there were blue lights flashing through the house. We followed the several sheriff deputies and proceeded to use forcible entry into the house by breaking the glass door. When law enforcement gets there and EMS, they're like, what happened here? I mean, there was a large man laying on a bed. You could see medical equipment around the bed. And I thought maybe he'd had a recent surgery and the sutures had broken or something like that. And he was, he was clutching himself in his belly area. He didn't know what happened. He said he was asleep and then woke up to excruciating pain in his abdomen. One of the police officers said, I saw his guts coming out between his fingers and thought, boy, if it, that guy lets go, we're in trouble. And then finally, they find a shotgun shell on the floor. After the location of the shotgun shell, Sergeant Trudy declared the house a crime scene. Celeste came out with a gun, and she said she was going to kill herself. And an ambulance came, and it took Celeste to St. David's Psychiatric Hospital. Stephen Beard is quickly rushed to the hospital with a shotgun blast to the stomach. His wife, Celeste, and her daughter, Christine, are found at the house, seemingly in shock. Police are trying to make sense of the scene. Was this a botched robbery? Or did someone want Stephen Beard dead? When they married, she was spending money like crazy. She once spent $7,000 on throw pillows. She would be on the internet at night on Walmart and different websites, Target, buying things. Two, three o'clock in the morning, she was on the computer buying. It was like she could never have enough. Well, at one point, he got really uh, to the point where he was so worried about the way he, she was spending money, he gave her the $500,000 that she was entitled to under the prenup. And he set her up with a financial counselor. He was going to teach her how to take care of that money, how to grow that money. But the problem was that six months later, instead of stocks, there was an empty bank account. She had spent all of the money. And when he sat her down and asked, where did it go? She couldn't tell him. It had gone for little things here and little things there. She went through a half million dollars in six months time. Despite all of this, she stole his dead wife's silver and jewelry and hawked it. And when Steve found out about that, he wanted a divorce. Celeste was worried if they got a divorce, she walked away with nothing but her jewelry and her personal possessions. Everything else was gone. So she was in the kitchen and she came out with a gun and she said she was going to kill herself. Christina, the, one of the twins, pleaded with her not to do it. Uh, it was a terrible scene. They called 911, and an ambulance came, and it took Celeste to St. David's Psychiatric Hospital in downtown Austin. What Celeste will do when she's in trouble, go, oh, I'm depressed, I'm suicidal, I'm just going to kill myself. And he'll say, no, 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 don't, don't, we'll work this out. And she'll go into a psych facility. And one of the times when she did that, Tracy Tarleton happened to be there too, and they became buds. Tracy was a gay woman. She ran the largest independent bookstore in Austin. She was the manager there, book people. She was funny, she's really smart, had a lot of friends, but Tracy was in St. David's because she was sincerely afraid she might commit suicide. She had gone into a very deep depression. She would uh, suffered abuse as a child. It had stayed with her. She was always looking for people she could take care of. And Celeste was a person who was always looking for someone to take care of her. So in a very strange way, these two women completed each other. Celeste had a horrendous childhood. Her mother went into the psychiatric facility several times, and she alleges that her father molested her, but he has always denied that. So any kind of childhood traumas 
that take place that are unresolved, the person unconsciously continues trying to resolve that trauma throughout the remainder of their life. So if an individual found someone who paid them attention, who mirrored them, provided them with love and care, not surprisingly, someone who was lacking in that area would glob onto that. Tracy and Celeste initially bonded at a level where uh, they were friends, but very quickly it turned romantic. Tracy would say that there were stolen kisses in doorways. There were times together where they kind of went off into little dark corners. From the day Celeste and Tracy met, Celeste had been setting up Tracy, saying, Steve is abusive to me. He's so horrible. He tells me what to wear, what to do. I have no freedom. He's driving me crazy. And Tracy would say, well, just leave him, just divorce him. And she'd say, I can't, he'll, he'll hunt me down, he'll find me. And Tracy believed that Celeste was really in trouble. She had Tracy convinced that Steve was this evil person. Steve at first thought Celeste and Tracy were just great friends. In fact, the first time he met her, he said, Come with us, go to graduation, come to the graduation party with us, come over and eat dinner with us. You know, we're having hamburgers on Wednesday night, come. One night, Tracy came over for hamburger night. Steve caught the two of them kissing and he became incensed and ordered her from the house and told Celeste to stay away from Tracy and that she wasn't welcome at the house anymore. Celeste had a tendency to drug Steve's food, put sleeping pills in him, switch out his cheap vodka with Everclear, get him so drunk that he'd pass out. She thought he's an alcoholic, this will speed up his death. But it wasn't fast enough. So one day he was passed out and she said, Tracy, come over here. And they were going to put a plastic bag over his head and Tracy was supposed to hold the plastic bag around his neck. And she saw Steve's air going in and out with the bag. And she stopped and said, I can't do this. I can't do this. They walked in the door and they asked if they could search. And in a closet, they found the shotgun. Tracy Tarleton has fallen in love with Celeste Beard, and the more time they spend together, the more she's convinced it's a matter of life and death. In Tracy's mind, she needs to protect Celeste from an overbearing and abusive Stephen Beard, or Celeste will soon be dead. On October 2nd, 1999, Tracy got her shotgun, that a few days before she'd gone out and shot to make sure it worked. Drove over to Celeste's house. She got out, opened the door, went around the back, went into Steve's bedroom. At one point, she thought, what am I doing? But I've got to do this to save Celeste. Walked in, stood at the foot of the bed, aimed her shotgun at Steve and went click, boom, and hightailed it out of there. Ironically, Steve didn't die after he was shot that night. He went to the hospital, he was in bad condition, but they were working on him and, and he was still alive. And at the hospital, Celeste said to the girls, don't say anything about Tracy to the police. Don't tell the police. But they did. The girls came forward, the kids came forward and said that they thought the police should talk to Tracy Charlton. So they showed up at Tracy's house. They walked in the door and they asked if they could search and she let them in. And in a closet, they found the shotgun that she had used and they made the arrest. And she ended up in jail, in the Travis County Jail. Stephen Beard underwent several surgical procedures. He seemed to respond to uh, surgery while he was released from the, uh, from the hospital, was transferred to a rehabilitation hospital, and it seemed as though everything was going well. 
He then was discharged from the hospital. Steve was only home for a couple of days. They brought him home from the hospital. Finally, he'd, he'd been so wanting to get home. They got him into the house, and he had a little bit of a rash, and she insisted he had to go back to the hospital. He presented to the hospital again and uh, was uh, transferred to the ICU. He started getting sicker and sicker. He had a fever, he had an infection, and the infection was going through his body. And he was there in bed, and Celeste and the girls went out for dinner one night, and Steve died while they were gone. There are multiple reasons that people say Steve died. One was a blood clot. One was an infection. Celeste was supposed to change his ileostomy bag. There was always supposition that her fingers were infected so that if she changed it, the infection would go into him. There are photographs of Celeste showing her infected fingers. So there's a chance Steve would have lived just fine. Right after Steve's funeral, Celeste was out partying, having sex with multiple people. Then one night, she was in a bar, picked up the bartender, said, be outside at 3 in the morning, we'll pick you up. And pretty soon, that bartender was partying with her in New Orleans. And then they got married. He said, I usually wasn't attracted to women Celeste age. I was surprised that I was, but I really was. Tracy had sincerely believed that Celeste loved her until Celeste married again, and she saw the announcement in the newspaper. At that point, she realized she'd been used, that she'd been just taken. For that year in jail, she had refused to talk about Celeste. She'd refused to, to give Celeste up in order to save her own skin. You know, with somebody who's a psychopath, just speaking generally, they're really considered a predator. Just as with predators in the wild, um, predators are very good at detecting vulnerable prey, individuals that are easily manipulative, may have had trauma in their past, and rightly so, they pick those individuals because they're more susceptible and more able to be manipulated. Tracy was really hurt. She had finally come to the realization that Celeste had probably never loved her, that Celeste had always seen her as someone she could manipulate and use. And she felt horrible. She was just riddled with guilt over the fact that she had committed a murder and that she also learned that Steve wasn't the man that Celeste had described, that he had never been an abusive husband. She'd refused to, to give Celeste up in order to save her own skin. But at that point, she talked to the district attorney and she told him everything. It was two years after Steve died, before Celeste was charged with his murder. How would you like it if your father was on top of you every night and then beating the crap out of you? Tracy Tarleton is crushed to learn the person she loved has gotten remarried so quickly. She then implicates Celeste in the murder of Stephen Beard. Is this a story of a woman scorned, or perhaps everything she believed was always just a delusion? As the trial begins, the lines of what's real and what's fantasy could get blurred to the point where the truth may be impossible to see. <laughs> Court calls cause number 9020236, the state of Texas versus Celeste Beard Johnson. It was two years after Steve died before Celeste was charged with his murder. 
When Celeste was in jail here in Austin, she broke her leg. And I do know that in December before the trial, she was told she could get the, the cast off her leg. And she said, well, wait, I need to talk to my attorney first about that. So did she think that cast was going to bring her sympathy from the jury? Celeste sat in the courtroom looking like a librarian. She looked nothing at all like she had looked before. She looked like a different person in that courtroom. This case is about something that happened to a man named Steve Beard. On October 2nd, 1999, he was 74 years old, and shortly before 3 o'clock that morning, he was asleep in his bed. He woke up suddenly in terrible pain, had a hole in his stomach, and he had his intestines spilling out the front of his body. The prosecution's case was that Celeste was a charming, evil manipulator who got Tracy to fall in love with her and set it up from the very beginning to eventually manipulate Tracy into killing Steve for her. Now, all through the summer of 1999, the defendant and Steve Beard had been planning to take a trip to Europe. She told Tracy that if she had to go on that trip with Steve, he was gonna drive her to commit suicide and Tracy would never see her again. So a few days before the scheduled departure to Europe, the defendant asked Tracy to shoot Steve. The evidence will show that what happened here is a simple case of a greedy, manipulative defendant who took advantage of a mentally ill woman who was in love with her. The defendant married an older guy with a lot of money. She got tired of waiting for him to die. She encouraged, directed, aided and attempted to aid this mentally ill woman to shoot him, and the defendant's motive to kill him was money. This is a case of fatal attraction. It's a case of obsession. We can agree on some things. Tracy Tarleton is psychotic. Dick DeGarren is one of Texas's most famous defense attorneys. Dick was the attorney for Robert Durst and managed to get Durst off. Tracy Tarleton fought her case and declared her innocence and said she was not guilty. And when it looked like she was about to go to trial and could get the death penalty or could get life, the rest of her life in prison, she cut a deal. And the deal that she cut with the prosecutors is that instead of facing an almost certain the rest of her life in prison, she would, if she would testify, that Celeste put her up to it. She would get the maximum of 20 years in prison, from which she could be paroled in as little as 10. The defense was going to prove that Celeste had never had this relationship with Tracy, that this was all a figment of Tracy Tarleton's imagination. And therefore, if that were true, then nothing Tracy had said could, could be trusted. We can agree that Tracy Tarleton shot Stephen Beard. Tracy Tarleton is an avowed lesbian. She is predatory. She is aggressive. And Tracy Tarleton became infatuated and obsessed with Celeste Beard. Celeste had never had a les lesbian relationship. Tracy knew Stephen Beard wanted Tracy out of their lives. Tracy was afraid of losing whatever delusional hope she thought she had with Celeste. So Tracy, we believe the evidence will show you, shot Stephen Beard for her own selfish and sick reasons. The trial was dramatic, it was funny, it was emotional, and pardon the pun, but it was insane. Can you please take a name? Jennifer L. Beard. Christina, how old are you? 22. Did you just have a birthday? Yes, ma'am. The girls got on the stand and they talked about the past, about what Celeste had done to Steve throughout the marriage. Well, she said that she married Steve for his money. She would say that. He disgusted her. Did she ever call him names? Yes. Like what? A fat <laughs> We had this dog that she would say, took our dog, Nikki. She'd point at Steve and go, Nikki, look at the cow. 
She would say, why wouldn't he die already? Now, did the defendant ever talk to you about what would happen to her financially after Sevier died? Just that she would get his money? They had seen a lot over the years, and I'm sure that when the jurors heard what they were saying, they understood more what had happened between Celeste and Steve. She put some sleeping pills in his food. I think it was like a chicken Kiev or something like that. Uh, she was knocking him out at night so that he would just, he'd fall asleep at the dinner table, and then she would go out. Did she tell you where she was? She, they, she was out with Jimmy. Sometimes I'd have to go pick her up. And did she stay out with Jimmy all night? Yes. Steve suspected that Celeste was having an affair, and she was with one of her prior husbands, her third husband. And this had gone on for a while. She threw the, the twins a graduation party and a 18th birthday party, but Steve wasn't invited. When people asked where he was that night, she said, oh, he wouldn't have liked this. And what they saw was her dancing with one of Rex's husbands. Did the defendant say anything to you about whether Steve <clears throat> was supposed to know about the party? After we went to the party, she said that he didn't know about it. But what was Celeste and Tracy's relationship? Celeste denies it to this day, but they were lovers. Celeste would sneak out and go to Tracy's house at night. How would she sneak out? She'd get Steve really drunk okay. and um, put sleeping pills in his food. Did the defendant ask you to lie about other things? It was kind of hard to keep up because she was always lying about something. And what was the reason that you recorded um, this phone conversation uh, between you and the defendant? You know, I felt like she was verbally abusing me. And um, I wanted her to hear what I was hearing. The prosecution played audio tapes that Christina and her boyfriend had made a, a phone call with Celeste. It was the most horrific, violent, abusive, profane tape. When you go to sleep tonight, Chris, you start your dreams by dreaming about how would you like it if your father was on top of you every night? And then speaking of the Christmas tree, you know, I know you're going to get And then Celeste says, at one point, I hired someone to kill Tracy, and the tape cut off. Now, Dick DeGaron claims that these audio tapes were fakes that were manipulated by Christina and her boyfriend. There's no proof of that. The jury, I think, really ultimately discounted their testimony. It ended up being not that important because there was other testimony that told the story. What did she say about exactly how she wanted you to shoot him? She wanted me to shoot him in the stomach. Why did she want you to shoot him in the stomach? Because she didn't want splatter. She didn't want blood splatter on the wall. The trial was long and contentious, with many twists and turns. In all, over 100 witnesses would be called by both the prosecution and defense. But none were more important or powerful than the testimony of Stephen Beard's shooter, Tracy Tarleton. Can you say your name, please? Tracy Tarleton. And how old are you? 45. I think the testimony that ended up being most important for me and probably a lot of the other jurors was Tracy Tarleton's. Now, in um, that short period of time that you and she were both patients at St. David's Hospital, did there ever develop any kind of relationship between y'all that was more than just a platonic friendship? Yes, I did. And we tell us about that. Um, tell, I'm sorry, tell us how that began. 
Well, at, at some point, not, I mean, within that period of time, uh, she followed me into my room one day and we ended up kissing, fondling, not anything else. After the defendant came back to Austin, did you continue to have contact with her? Yes. And did the defendant ever visit you at your home? Yes. Did she ever come to your home at night? Yes. About how often did she come to your home at night? It was, you know, three or four nights a week when we first, when she first got back, um, depending on what was going on at home. I mean, she had to, you know, put her husband to bed. The thing about her testimony that was kind of extraordinary is going into it, you had to have a big reasonable doubt because she was getting such a good deal for this testimony. And so that just immediately made the bar a lot higher for her to be convincing. I mean, I did believe everything she told me about what was going on. And I just felt real bad for her. And so I didn't have a lot of, and he's, you know, from what I knew, he was a terrible man. And he wouldn't let her up. He and wouldn't let her up. And so I, I didn't have a lot of judgment about it, to tell you the truth. She just ended up being so articulate and being a convincing witness. Yes, she asked me to, that she had a plan, and she wanted me to shoot him at Toro Canyon with my shotgun. Uh, she said, I, I, I can't, I can't make it anymore. I can't do it. Uh, he had to drive her to kill herself. You know, she appeared as she often did and was more frequently appearing, which was very shaken, very unnerved and desperate, desperate. And I, I just saw this, this woman that I loved in a desperate situation, trying to find a way to survive this man that was so awful. I said, um, I don't want to do this. She said, she said, there's nothing left. You know, I might as well, I might as well just take it right now and shoot myself. And I, I said, fine, let's go. I'll do it. So you agreed to do it? I agreed to do it. Tracy got on the stand, and really the whole case kind of hinged on how she came across on the stand. She was calm, she was studied, and she laid out in detail the relationship with Celeste and how the murder plot had come together. What did she say about exactly how she wanted you to shoot him? She wanted me to shoot him in the stomach. Why did she want you to shoot him in the stomach? Because she didn't want splatter. She didn't want a blood splatter on the wall. Is, is that the word she used, splatter? She used splatter. Okay. Um, did she say why she didn't want a blood splatter on the wall? She, at the time, was not planning on redecorating. You know, I think the jury judged Tracy based on what they saw in that courtroom. And what they saw was someone who'd been manipulated and hurt, and someone who came across as being very truthful on the stand. Did you read an article in the newspaper um, relating to the defendant that um, had some information that surprised you? Yes, I read an article in the paper um, that talked about um, a different hearing and that Celeste was not present at the hearing because she was on her honeymoon in Aspen with and her new husband. What did you think at that point? I was I was dumbfounded when I read that, and then quickly everything started falling apart in my mind. Everything started falling apart in my mind. That you know I realized within a couple of months that everything that she had ever told me was not, was untrue. Tracy Tarleton's story never changed. Celeste's story always changed. But Dick DeGaron, his whole case rested on his belief that Tracy Tarleton is a crazy, psychotic, delusional lesbian obsessed with Celeste Beard, and that she, on her own, killed Steve Beard so that she could have Celeste. You <clears throat> have frequently been suicidal. Yes, sir. You would agree with me that you have been homicidal. Yes, sir. Dick went right after Tracy and tried to portray her as unstable in the courtroom, but it was a problem because she didn't come across that way. You've got to understand, I believed her. I really believed her. It seems 
strange from this vantage to look back and think that I did, but I did. I don't think the argument that Tracy was this gay predator and that, the, that she'd gone after Celeste worked with that jury at all. There was just too much evidence on the other side. And I don't think that they at any point cared about her sexual orientation. Did the defendant and Tracy Charlton also discuss an issue with you relating to um, a sexual relationship? Yes, sir. What did the defendant say to you about that? Towards the end of the session, uh, Ms. Beard uh, made a statement that she wasn't sure whether or not she was a lesbian and that in her sexual relationship with um, Ms. Tarleton that she had to drink in order to be sexual. State versus Celeste here, Johnson. Verdict of the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant, Celeste Beard Johnson. The prosecution and defense have been battling for more than six weeks. As the trial reaches the end, the pressures and hostility that were building are now becoming more clear to everyone in the courtroom. It's a slugfest, and neither side pulls any punches as they move to closing arguments. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As someone once said, it has been a strange and long trip, hasn't it? Uh, you've been in here for six weeks, and you've heard things I imagine that back in January you did not think you would be hearing in the court of law. I know defense is going to bring all these hospital records and medical records in here about how crazy Tracy Tarleton was. But maybe she was crazy. Maybe she was just in love. You know, she is not the first person uh, to do something crazy for love. Steve Beard was a fool in love, but he was no fool because Steve Beard made sure that this woman he lifted up off the street with nothing, was not going to take everything he had. And that's why he had a prenup. He told Dr. Hauser, you know, things are going crazy with my wife. She's using aliases. She's going places and not telling me where she's going. She's doing things and not telling me what she's doing. Steve Beard was on her trail. Yes, he was. And he would have divorced her. Tracy Tarleton killed Stephen Beard on her own for her own selfish reasons for her own sick reasons. She, for her own obsession with Celeste, she went to that house at three o'clock in the morning and went in and shot Stephen Beard as he lay in his bed. At the beginning of the trial, Dick DeGaron said, they were not lovers. This was a figment of Tracy's imagination, she was delusional, she was psychotic. And by the end of the trial, in closing arguments, he said, maybe they did have a sexual relationship. Big deal, so what? Why does Tracy threaten Steve Beard? Because Tracy sees Steve Beard as the barrier between her and her dream relationship with Celeste. In closing arguments, as you looked over and suddenly the defense table was empty and there was a pillow and a sheet. You've seen pictures of it. It was very heavy. He had a very big stump. Dick DeGaron climbed up on the table and when he's putting up the sheet, you could see the jurors groan. Like, how stupid and sensationalistic do you think we are? Tracy Tarleton shot Steve Beard in the stomach because it's the only thing, the biggest target she had. And I don't say that to denigrate Steve Beard. I say it because it's important for you to understand that Tracy Tarleton is a liar. She's a fabricator of evidence. She's delusional. She's psychotic. My take on the defense strategy is that they underestimated the jury. The jury was just like, come on, man. That's, we're smarter than this. At this time, the jury has heard all of the closing arguments. 
We're gonna have dinner for y'all and y'all can go back there and deliberate. As someone who has watched trials, you're never sure of anything, particularly as they debated for so very long. I know there were other jurors who were ready to just call, call her guilty and move on. I thought there was enough reasonable doubt to where we should go through a deliberative process, which is why I voted not guilty on the first round. The jurors walked back in and didn't look at Celeste when they entered the courtroom, and that's always a bad sign. And a few minutes later, they delivered the verdict. OK, Ms. Johnson, would you please stand? At the state versus Celestia Johnson, verdict of the jury, verdict form one, capital murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Celestia Johnson, guilty of the offense of capital murder. When the final verdict was read, I do remember being a little bit nervous about having to sit and look at Celeste, knowing that I'm sending her to prison, possibly for life. However, I knew I did the right thing, and that based on the facts of the case, there wasn't any other choice. A lot of people in Austin always believed that Celeste had killed Steve. I think there was relief in Austin over this case when it finally ended. The thing that got me from not guilty to guilty was what other story could you tell that explains Celeste Beard's behavior after the shooting? And at some point, you just couldn't come up with any other explanation. I really believe justice was served in this case. I actually see Tracy Charlton as another of Celeste's victims. I believe what she said was true, that Celeste was the mastermind, the planner, and had the motive for killing Steve. I find this one of the saddest cases. No one was a winner. Tracy had her life ruined. All of the kids, even their friends, feel guilty that they did not stand up to Celeste. Celeste still denies that she had anything to do with this. When I look back on this case, I think about how much pain that one woman caused in so many lives. Celeste, I don't think, was born a bad person, but had developed over the years into this user who used people and manipulated people. And she ruined uh, Tracy's life. She ended Steve's life. And she had, she'd given those two girls such terrible childhood it was just it's distressing to think that a mother could have acted toward children as she did tracy tarleton was paroled after serving 10 years in prison for her crime she says she never stopped feeling remorse for her part in the killing of stephen beard as for celeste she received a life sentence and will spend the rest of her days in prison. She still maintains her innocence and claims Tracy acted alone. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew.